Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. I want to welcome you all here to Finley Lake Church on this third Sunday of Advent. Can you believe it? Uh, Christmas is in two weeks away and is in two weeks and we're looking forward to uh, a wonderful two weeks as we have some awesome events planned. Um, I'll tell you about those in a minute, but just want to welcome you all here in the name of Jesus and uh, just remind you that we come into this place loved beyond what we can possibly imagine and beyond what we can um, even fathom in our minds. And so we um, are in the presence of God who meets us and is uh, ready to pour out his grace upon us as we begin this new week together. We worship you, Lord, and magnify you, God, our Savior. Our hearts will not be afraid. You are coming to uh, you save our people. The blind will receive their sight. The lame will walk. The dead will be raised. Streams will pour faith in the wilderness and the desert filled with living water. God will tear down the mighty from their thrones and lift up the lowly. Strengthen our hearts, Lord. Give us steadfast and firm faith. Sorrow and sin will pass away. God will wipe the tears from our eyes. On that day, we will be filled with everlasting joy and gladness. We wait patiently for you, Lord, because you will fulfill your promises. Your mercy is for those who fear you from generation to generation. Hear the good news. Christ is coming and will reign forever. Praise the Lord. All our hope is in the Lord our God. Come, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord, and magnify you, God our Savior. Our hearts will not be afraid. God, you are coming to save our people. Merry Christmas. Jesus, we thank you as we begin worship that you are our coming king. You have come once. You came to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Right in this moment, you come to our hearts, and through your Holy Spirit, you want to come and fill each and every one of us with your love, your grace, and your truth. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to live faithful lives that you that when you come again at any moment, that we would be ready, that we would be living faithfully and expectantly. So Jesus, awake our hearts today. Uh, Help us to fix our minds on you. And as we worship, we pray that your Holy Spirit would, would fall afresh upon us, reviving us, bringing new life, new hope, new purpose, new power. Jesus, may you be praised here in worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the ways we worship God is through singing, but another way we worship God and declare his goodness is by sharing what the Lord has done in our lives. And um, Floyd has uh, a testimony he'd like to share about how God has been at work. And so we um, thank Floyd for coming to share from his heart. And let's just welcome Floyd together this morning. So good to see you folks this morning. I uh, wasn't here last week and had a little interruption. And I always feel like I've lost something when I haven't been able to go to church. I don't know about how you folks feel about it, but I I do. I feel like I've missed something. And uh, God is so good. And don't you just love Christmas? Uh, It's just kind of in the air. You know, I mean, it just really is. It's it's a very special, special time. Uh, I think the the biggest thing to take away from Christmas is the fact of, you know, Jesus coming, you know, his birth, that he came and actually interrupted our world, let's put it that way, at the time, uh, for the good. Of all of us and uh, last year wasn't a a very wonderful time for Patty and I Uh, three days before Thanksgiving my mother passed away and you're just kind of in shock when all that happens Uh, and you know your normalcy is just out the door but you know, and it God God worked through all of all of that. But it was shortly after that, uh, Patty and I both ended up with COVID. And if you remember, we were very sick last year, and Patty almost didn't make it there for a couple of days. We didn't know if she was going to survive. Uh, 
she had COVID and double pneumonia. It happened really fast. She'd been sick for 10 days and you know, you just kind of have to, to work through that. But one night she just really tanked. I mean, went downhill really fast. And uh, if you've ever held a, a small child with a fever, she, she was just floppy in my arms that night to pick her up and dress her. And I mean, I was, I was so weak myself. I mean, it's a miracle that I was able to actually get her to the car and, and get her to the hospital. But, you know, when you love somebody, God just gives you what you need at the time. You know, he gives you the strength, he gives you the words, and it was really neat to see how God just walked us through that time. And thank God for church family. Thank God for cell phones, you know, because we could talk. Uh, and I really didn't, when I dropped her off that night, I did not know if I would see her again. I mean, that's, it was just the hardest thing I ever did. Uh, and, I, you know, I wanted to stay, but it's, it's so upside down at that time, you know, they, they came to me and said, sir, you cannot stay, you know. And I, you know, I wasn't as sick as she was, but I was sick, but they just said, you cannot stay, you have to leave. And so they basically kicked me out. <laughs> and on my way home, you know, I, I just said to the Lord, is, is, this, is this the last, you know, is this where it ends? Uh, And, you know, it's funny how your mind works and all that, because as I was driving home, all, I, I, I just saw a picture of Patty when she walked down the aisle towards me. You know, I remember being nervous, which I think most people are nervous on their wedding day. But the minute I saw her walking towards me, it, it was all gone, just like that. And, uh, and God just brought that to mind. And, and I knew that, that whether she lived or died, I would see her again. But, and it's such a comfort to have that, you know, in your heart. Uh, but, you know, through, through everyone's prayers, God's goodness, uh, you guys are just such a great church family. I mean, meals come into the door and, uh, you know, uh, people just calling and, you know, being concerned. It was just the, the neatest thing to see how God walked us through that. And, you know, Patty was really sick for a long time after that. She had to be on oxygen for almost two months. And quite frankly, she hasn't really fully recovered from it. It did damage her lungs, and she has some problems because of it now. But, but in that, God, all I can tell you is God has blessed us so much. And I think <laughs> she had said something to me the other day, and I just thought it was funny. She said, uh, do you do you mind being married to an old woman? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I said, if you don't mind being married to an old man. And uh, I just told her she's my greatest treasure. Uh, there is nothing that I have that even comes close to Patty. I mean, she is my greatest treasure. And... So God has really blessed us. We got to celebrate 45 years this year, which that almost didn't happen. And uh, I'm just so thankful for that. But one of the things last year, and it just shows you how God hears us, even when, even when, we're, not, even when we're not praying how, you know, we say something and God responds to it just because he loves us. And one of the things I, I have always loved about Christmas is to come to church and sing the Christmas carols. You know, I mean, those are, 
those are just priceless to me. You know, I, I look so forward to it every year. And <clears throat> I remember saying to Patty last year, I said, boy, I'm really going to miss, you know, I mean, you can, you can see the stuff on TV and whatever, but it's not the same as being in the fellowship, you know. And I, I just casu casually said that to her, and on Christmas Eve, there were carolers outside our door singing Christmas carols. You know, and I had just said that casually, you know, and God just, you know, did it. You know, he, he laid it on the hearts of people to come to our, our house and sing Christmas carols. You will never know how much that meant to us. Uh, Patty, Patty just melted, you know. And I opened the door so she could see everybody. And again, I just didn't want to go without sharing how God had walked us through all that. And what a blessing you are to us as a church, family. Uh, we have something very special here. It is God blessed without a doubt. Uh, and I just really appreciate everyone. Thank you. This morning, our scripture is out of Matthew, the second chapter, verses 1 through 6. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, well, this morning we are continuing our series called Roots. And what we're doing in this series is remembering that Jesus didn't poof, emerge from nowhere, but he comes to us in, in a context. He comes to us in history, and he comes to us from a people, the people of Israel. He comes to us from a place, the, the, the city, the town of Bethlehem, and he comes to us from the story, the covenant story of God and humanity that began um, thousands of years ago, even before that, and, and uh, continues on um, through today. And today we're focused on that second part, that God comes to us from a place, the town of Bethlehem. So let's just think about towns and cities and the sizes of different places. And I don't know what your earliest upbringing was like. Maybe you grew up not far from here. Uh, I grew up about a two and a half or three hour drive away. I grew up in the town of Greece outside of Rochester. It's a suburb of Rochester where all of my friends, it seemed like, were Roman Catholic and had parents work at Kodak. So I was a son of a Protestant pastor and so I was, I was quite different. And I had bright orange red hair, which also set me apart, but that, that, that's not in the notes. So, so uh, we'll move on. But my town it was about 100,000 people. Um, we had four large high schools in our town. Uh, we had three ice hockey rinks within 15 minutes, not significant to most of you, significant to me. Um, lots of restaurants, uh, lots of stores right around. Um, I could, like I said, there are a lot of things close by. But my town was medium-sized, but it wasn't large. It certainly wasn't a destination city like New York or L.A. or Rome uh, or London or, or a city that's uh, famous worldwide. Um, it seems that our world is often impressed. I know many of us here probably live in a rural area because we you know, don't love the, the busyness. Maybe we want to visit, and then we're glad to go back home uh, where it's a little quieter. But um, it seems that in our world, so many who want to be famous or so many who want to change the world think it's in the, the busy streets and the bright lights where that life of impact or that life of significance will be lived. Um, famous people often live in the big cities. Performers want to go to Broadway. Uh, it just seems that if you want to be somebody important, that you go or live in the, the large destination cities around the globe. What's amazing to me is that that's not how Christ came. 
Jesus came in the small, seemingly insignificant town of Bethlehem. And we'll get to the significance of uh, that town, but I just want to say there are some perks to living in a small town. Uh, I remember when I was moving to the first small town I ever lived in, Belfast, New York, about 15 years ago. I was in transition, and one day I went to the post office in Buffalo, and there were, we were like herded like cattle, and there were like five people working behind the counter. I got to the counter. I, had to, I needed a two-inch piece of tape to seal the package that I was mailing, and the person behind the counter, I saw, I saw tape like I could reach it and grab that tape if I wanted to. But, but I said, can I borrow a piece of tape just to seal this package? She said, no, I'm not allowed to give you tape. You have to buy a roll. They're $9. And I, I was like, whoa, okay. This was kind of cold and unfriendly. And then the next day, I called the post office in the small town where I was going to live, in the town of Belfast. And I said, hi, my name's Dave Cook. My family's moving into town. I'd like to reserve a, a post box so that I can get my mail at the post office. He said, oh, you're the new pastor. I heard you were coming. I heard you're kind of tall, so um, I'm not giving you a box down low so you have to hunch over every day. I, I found a box. It's kind of easy to reach. And uh, yeah, we look forward to welcoming you when you come into town. I'm like, whoa. And, and I thought, what a contrast between like, you know, buffalo, busyness, you're just a person in line in this busy office and this small town where the post guy knew I was coming. I'm not that tall, six feet, but he knew I shouldn't have like the bottom mailbox in the post office. And I thought, well, there are some blessings to coming from a small town or going to live in a small town. But um, as we look at the place from which Jesus comes to us, it was this small, seemingly insignificant town of Bethlehem. It was not even Jerusalem, which was maybe five or six miles away. Bethlehem and Jerusalem are not all that far away, but you would think that Jesus at least would be born in Bethlehem if he wants to make a splash, or if you wanted to, he could have certainly chosen a bigger city. Jesus is the only one who, I guess, could really choose where he wanted to be born. You know, the rest of us, it's just, we're, we're born where we are. But Jesus was, it was God's design, it was God's plan that Jesus would be born in the small, seemingly insignificant town of Bethlehem. And it's a very unknown village on the map, probably less than 1,000 people. Some people maybe think it had three or 400 people. Not a very large town at all. And I want to focus, though, on how God can do amazing, extraordinary, significant things, even in small places and in the lives of, when we feel like our lives are small and insignificant, God can do extraordinary, world-changing things through us if we are faithful and give our lives to him. But let's just focus on the significance of Bethlehem in terms of who Jesus is and how he came. Some of these things, we'll be looking at what I shared with the kids, that Bethlehem means house of bread. Uh, some is what we're looking at the scriptures, at what we find in the scriptures in Matthew 2 that Gordon read. And then we'll also think about one thing that was going on historically in Bethlehem as we think about who Jesus is and the significance that he was born in Bethlehem. So as we look to the text of Matthew chapter 2, the Magi show up in Jerusalem looking for the one born king of the Jews. It's interesting that King Herod and the chief priests and the people in Bethlehem, they weren't noticing that the new king had been born, but these people who weren't even the people of Israel from hundreds of miles away are, are focused on who this newborn king is as they see his star rising. And they make their way to Jerusalem looking for the one born king of the Jews. They travel hundreds of miles. They show up and King Herod is just like dumbfounded when he hears people showing up looking for the king of the Jews. Immediately he, he feels threatened like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm the head honcho here. I'm the king. What are you talking about, king of the Jews? And so he goes to his chief priest to say, what, what do the scriptures say? I don't know the scriptures. What do the scriptures say about where the king will be born? And picking up in Matthew chapter 2, verse 4, it says, When he, Herod, had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So we'll, we'll focus in on that statement a little bit about um, what will come from Bethlehem. But again, I first, I want to just start by talking about the name Bethlehem. It means the house of bread. And a couple decades later, as Jesus would begin his public ministry, or while he was in his public ministry, Jesus looked at people after the feeding of the 5,000, and he turned to them and he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever, whoever comes to me will never be hungry. 
As I shared with the kids, when Jesus was born, he was placed in a manger, in a feeding trough, where God's creatures come to eat. And it might just be an insignificant detail, but I believe it's more, as I shared with the kids, that when we go through this life hungry and weak and looking for something to fill our empty hearts and souls, we have Jesus who says, I am the bread of life. Come to me and you will never be hungry. You know, I, there's a lot, there are a lot of ways I could go when I think about the bread of life, but, but what came to me this week as I, was, as I was praying and studying is just how common addictions are in our country, in our world, in our lives. And we try to fill our lives with all kinds of things. And some things are just good things that, that creep in and just over, overtake our lives. Other things are more sinister and more destructive. But we try to fill our lives with so much. We fill our lives with busyness and activities and shopping and sports and news and social media. Um, sometimes it's substance, substances or you know, other things to try to fill what's going on inside. And I just wonder, could it be that we're filling our lives with so many things? because we're not first going to the bread of life who wants to feed our thirsty souls, our, our hungry souls. He's also the, the living water, but I don't want to mess that up. He's the bread of life, though, who fills our hungry hearts and souls. Uh, I was watching a short video clip by Brian Russell. He shared at Family Bible Camp um, in, the, in years past. But um, he was uh, walking along and doing a video just talking about addiction. He teaches spiritual formation at Asbury Seminary, the, the campus in Florida, and he was talking about addiction, and he said something that I thought was interesting. He said, you'll never break an addiction if you see it as the main problem. Addiction is often named as the big problem in a person's life, but that's actually not true, or it's a half-truth. The truth is that an addiction is a solution. An addiction is a bad solution to an even deeper problem. So when you're ready to become that person that you were created to be, don't fight against your addiction as if that's the main problem. Instead, ask yourself, what is it deep down inside I'm afraid to feel, that I'm afraid to face? And I might ask the question, what am I lacking in my life that I am trying to fill? Addiction, yes, it's a problem, but don't think of it as the main problem. But what is the root? What is the emptiness? What is the void that that addiction is supposed to fill? And then think about how can Jesus enter into those places where I'm fearful, where I'm seeking an escape, where I'm angry, where I'm hurting, and invite Jesus into that place that's, that's seeking out an addiction to fill what Jesus, the bread of life, wants to heal and fill and satisfy. Again, just reading from John 6, Jesus said this, For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. They were thinking about the manna they got, their ancestors got in the wilderness. They were thinking about the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. But Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life, and he wants to feed our hungry souls. Second, and this comes right from the passage, Jesus is the king of kings. He's that ruler that was prophesied in the book of Micah. Again, these magi travel all the way to King Jesus, and they bow down and they worship him. I think it's amazing that non-Jewish people travel hundreds of miles to follow that star, and when they get to Jesus, and again, it's probably not day five, it's probably year one and a half or whatever it was, but they bow down and they worship the baby King Jesus. Worship, we could say so much about it, but worship is about giving God our loving attention and gratitude and submitting ourselves to the King of the world. We can spend our lives in this world worrying or we can redirect our hearts and focus on worshiping. And that's a choice every day that we have to make. Am I going to worry and just allow these anxious thoughts to cycle through my mind? Or by the grace of God, am I going to turn to God's word and fix my eyes on Jesus and, and discard worry and embrace worship and, and focus my eyes away from the, the, the things that are making me worried, focus my eyes away from the problem and focus them on the problem solver 
and, and give God praise that he is able to work in our lives, that he's saved our souls, that, that, he, that our lives are in his hands. Though our world is sinful and broken, and so often we look around and we think, what is going on? We have to remember that Jesus is at the right hand of God, that he is on the throne. He, he's not asleep or um, aloof or uncaring, but Jesus awake, he's alert, he's attentive, and, and everything in our lives is held in his hands. And again, though our world seems out of control, we can slow down, surrender to the Lord's control, and as we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's such a simple prayer, but Jesus is king. He, he's not a little helpless baby in a manger. He, he's on the throne. And, and what a powerful statement. So often we can just go through the Lord's prayer and, and not really focus on the power. But whenever you're focused on something where you are wanting to worry, where you're wanting to just allow your thoughts to spin out of control, you just pray that simple prayer to the king of kings. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. In my life, in my heart, in this situation, your kingdom come. You're asking for the king of kings to bring his power and influence into this situation. And we can trust him to lead us through it. Jesus is the king of kings. He is that ruler who comes from the Davidic line, the line of David, from the root of Jesse. And we can trust him as he's on the throne uh, this morning and every day. So, Jesus is the bread of life. Bethlehem means house of bread. He is the king of kings. He is that ruler that comes from the line of David. And finally, as we look at one last thing, Jesus is the lamb of God. Agnes Dei is what that, that Latin phrase is. He's the lamb of God. So this one we have to think about what was going on in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago when Jesus came. And we may not see it explicitly, explicitly written like this, but Bethlehem was the place where the lambs were raised that were used for temple sacrifice in Jerusalem. And every firstborn male lamb from around Bethlehem was considered holy and set aside for its special use as a sacrifice in Jerusalem. And shepherds would lay their lives on the line to, to raise these little lambs and to prepare the, the firstborn ones and set them aside. And then after a while, they would take them to Jerusalem where they would be able to be used for temple sacrifice. And the Jews would sacrifice a lamb in the Passover celebration as a, as a life-for-life offering that would cleanse the sin of the nation and remind them of how God had delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. And so this would happen in the temple, and as they would offer the sacrifice of the lamb, it was a way of, of thinking about their cleansing of, from guilt and, the, and sin, and they would try to uphold this old covenant. In Jesus, we have something so much better and so, something so much greater. In Jesus, God comes to us as the Lamb of God. In Jesus, God comes to us as the bridge between a sinful humanity and a holy, righteous God. And in the sacrifice of Jesus, our, our sins are atoned for, our sins are washed away, and humanity and God are reconciled. Not through what we do, not through what we've earned, not through how much scripture we've memorized, but because of the blood of Christ shed for us, Sinful humanity and a holy God are brought back into uh, a, a right relationship. And though God never stops loving us, our sin separates us from him, but through God's grace and provision, the lamb was offered that was slain for the world, that makes forgiveness and new life possible. In Jesus, God comes to us as the lamb of God. Jesus did not come to stay in that manger, but to go to the cross, and he is the king born to die as a lamb. One of the gifts the Magi, the Magi brought was myrrh, a burial spice. Imagine that, a burial spice being brought to this little baby that, that was a way of kind of fore, foreshadowing what his ultimate destiny and what his ultimate purpose would be that, he would be, that he would die on the cross for your sins and mine. And on that, on that cross, Jesus would make that supreme sacrifice for you and me and for all the human family, that whoever trusts in that sacrifice as being their once-for-all sacrifice for sin, that would atone for their sins, Jesus credits that to our righteousness. And imagine, guys, I know, what a, I know how much the Lord still has to do in my life, but I walk along as a forgiven and freed man because of what Christ has done for me. 
You and I, I know that if we were to put a, a, a video recording of all the ways that we've failed our families or all the ways that we've hurt other people or, or just our, our, our most unbecoming moments, none of us would want that shown. If we think about the words we've spoken, the actions that we've had, the thoughts that we've allowed to cycle too often, you know, we can think about how we are, we are desperate sinners in need of a Savior. But because of the grace of Christ, because he is the Lamb of God, because his blood washes away our sins, we don't have to walk around carrying that shame. Because Romans 8 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. And you can walk, you can walk around freed knowing I am a forgiven sinner cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Thanks be to God. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20, think about these words. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So Peter there writes about how Jesus is the Lamb of God, that perfect sacrifice to end all other sacrifices. I just want to take this one step further and think about what Revelation 21 says. There's a book of life called what? The Lamb's Book of Life. And at the very end of the story, at the very end of the Bible, in Revelation 21, one chapter from the very last page, the Apostle John writes about this vision, this this revelation that he has, and he he sees what's coming. He sees the history, or he sees the future for those who are in Christ, and he writes these words as he writes about the new Jerusalem and the new earth and the new heavens and all of that as God brings uh, to fulfillment the, the restoration and the redemption of this world. He writes this, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light And the kings of earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, this is something to celebrate if you have it and something to really pray about and have a burden for as you think about those who don't. You know, as we look at one chapter before in Revelation 20, it talks about the Lamb's Book of Life, but it talks about those whose names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life. And again, I can't describe fully what John saw, but what John describes for those whose names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life is a lake of fire. And that is a, that is a heavy reality for those whose names are not in the Lamb's book of life. But, but Jesus has come as the Lamb of God to make a way possible for everyone who believes. And, and Jesus, Jesus says, you know, there's a, there's a wide road and there's a narrow road. He says this in Matthew 7 where he says, wide is the gate and broad is the road that, that leads to destruction and death. And many take that road. But narrow is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and few find it. And and it's important for us as we read the scriptures to ask ourselves, which road am I on? Am I on the narrow road that leads to life made possible by the Lamb of God who who died on the cross for my sin? Or am I on the wide wide road? Am I taking the wide gate that leads to destruction and death? And, And Jesus lovingly says, come, come and take the narrow road that I have provided for you. It raises a question in our minds, what are we doing with the truth of what God reveals in his word? Are we living each day just thankful and grateful and humbled if our name is in the Lamb's book of life? And are we praying, Lord, help me to live for you each day that I might point other people to the, to the amazing grace you offer that saves people from sin and gives them new life? This week, I was talking to somebody who uh, not a believer, and um, just was talking about how empty their life is and talking about how living life without purpose and without hope. And, uh, 
I, w- I was sharing with this person, I was saying, everything that you're saying you do not have, I have found through my faith in Jesus Christ. And the person was like, oh, that's great for you. I'm glad you have that, but that, that's not me. And, and, and everything in my heart just wanted to cry out to them. It can be you. This is not a gift because of anything special I've done. It's a free gift for you to receive for yourself. What a gift to know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What a gift it is, even as, I mean, Floyd could not share the testimony he did today without knowing that his and his wife's names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. To face, to face what Floyd faced apart from Christ and, and that hope, I don't know how anybody can do that. But through the gift of Jesus, we, we have this treasure within that says, I have the greatest gift that this world can ever offer. I found the greatest hope. It's not in finding fame and money and popularity in the big city. It's found in the one who came to a small, obscure, poor little village, who, who grew up to die on the cross for my sins, who rose again and is seated at the right hand of God so I can have a relationship with God and be filled with his love and peace. That's where hope comes from. How do you face that apart from Christ? And if we have that, how do we not live and share that in such a way that people are gripped with the Christ that we have and want to embrace him for themselves? I love how when Jesus was beginning his public ministry, you know, so many had no clue who Jesus was or what he was about. But somehow good old John the Baptist, JTB, looked at his relative, looked at his cousin Jesus as he's beginning his ministry, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You and I have a reason to live every day. It's it's to live a life of worship and gratitude for who Christ is, that that he's come as the Lamb of God to die for our sins, to to give us life, and we we can have this, this peace and joy because we know anything that happens to me Nothing that happens to me can, can remove the, the salvation I found in Christ. Nothing in my life can, can shake the faith or can shake the, the God who is in me working to fulfill his purposes. So this morning, as we think about the small little town of Bethlehem, let's remember the significance that Jesus came and was born in the house of bread, Bethlehem. He was placed in a manger in a feeding trough where God's creatures comes to eat. And if anyone, is, if anyone is hungry, if anyone has a soul that feels empty, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If anyone feels like this world or their lives are out of control, we have the high king of heaven who sits on the throne, who says, I will take your life and I will govern you, I will lead you, I will guide you, and you may go through hell, you may go through hard times in this world. In this world, you will have trouble. But I am the king who will walk with you and see you through. And know what happens at the end of the book. That there is a new heaven. There is a new earth. I am making all things new. Some of us need to get off the throne and let Jesus take the wheel, as Carrie Underwood would say, and let him be the king of kings. Some of us are trying to live our lives for ourselves and it's not going very well. And we have a king who says, are you ready to yield control to me yet? He's the king of kings foretold in the the prophet Micah and through hundreds of other prophecies. And last but not least, he's a lamb of God. And that small little obscure village where lambs were raised to be used as sacrifices in the temple, Jesus comes and he says, I am the lamb of God who's come to die on the cross for you. So you you don't have to carry the, the, the stain of your sin and the shame of your past, but it can be cleansed and forgiven and you can be made new. Friends, how do you need to receive the significance of who Jesus has come, of who Jesus is and how he has come through Bethlehem? Maybe you need to embrace him as the bread of life this morning and know that that emptiness that you feel Jesus wants to to satisfy as we we just treasure his word, as we come alongside others and pray with them and for them, as we worship and listen to praise music, he wants to fill our lives with his grace. He, He wants to rule and govern our lives if we will just submit to him. And he wants us to live with the treasure, with the blessing of knowing that our, lamb, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's embrace him today and worship him as our Savior. Let's live to know him and make him known. Um, we have a world that needs to receive the treasure of what we have.
Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are a God who can do world-changing things in small places and in small people. Lord Jesus, I think about how you gathered together 12 ordinary, insignificant people, fishermen, tax collectors, ordinary people, to carry out the mission of why you came. And now, Lord, 2,000 years later, we might think, oh, we're small people in a small town, and what can you do with us? And Jesus, we know that because of the power and the hope of the gospel, because of the power of who you are and what you've done and why you've come, we can live lives of extraordinary significance as we embrace you as Savior and live to make you known. Jesus, I pray for anyone here who does not know if their name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. I pray that they would, just, that they would know that they can receive forgiveness and a new identity as a child of God simply by saying, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Come into my life and forgive me and wash me and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live every day for you. Lord, I pray for those that need to receive that today. May today be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray for those of us who have been living with you on the back burner for far too long. And you want to do something seismic in our hearts. You want to reignite our faith as we treasure you, as we embrace you as the bread of life, the King of kings, the Lamb of God. Holy Spirit, come and fall afresh upon your people. Wake us up to be the people you're calling us to be. Draw us to you. And Lord, help us not to take your gifts for granted. We love you, Jesus. We offer you now our hearts as we begin this new week. We offer our tithes, our uh, a portion, the first fruits of what you've given us. We offer our, our talent, our treasure, because you are worthy of everything that we have to offer. Lord, you are so precious. Come and speak to us now and help us to receive you more deeply into our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you've been here and God has been uh, nudging your heart to just pray or if God has been at work in some way and you just want to pray with someone, please come and find me right after the worship. There, nothing is, there's no greater joy than just praying with someone to receive Christ, um, whether it's for the first time or just more, more fully into their lives. And um, if God's been speaking, um, don't, don't ignore that nudge. Um, thanks so much for coming to worship. Stick around for hospitality time. Make sure to come back for the concert tomorrow, uh, 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock for the cookies and all that good stuff. Uh, but remember, Jesus is the bread of life before cookies. So if cookies are a problem, just anyway. But, um, but have, a, have an awesome week. If there's any way that we can serve you, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out. So as you go from this place, ready to worship the bread of life, the King of kings, and the Lamb of God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. To all God's people said, amen. Amen, amen. Have a great, great week.